Good afternoon and welcome to uh, our conversation today. This is part of the report on LTE licensed uh, and its existence with uh, Wi-Fi from uh, uh, Sensafili. And that is being done in uh, collaboration with RCR Wireless News. Uh, today with me I have Edgar Figueroa, the CEO and President of the Wi-Fi Alliance. Um, and uh, well, Edgar, thanks for taking the time to talk to us today. Thanks for having me, Monica. Nice to be here. That's great. I'm, I'm very happy to have you here because uh, uh, Wi-Fi has been using the 5 gigahertz band that uh, LTE license is uh, planning to use uh, for a very long time and uh, for uh, it's still relatively new technology and still moving fast ahead like uh, Wi-Fi. Um, you, you're in a way the incumbent. At the same time, there are many other technologies that use uh, uh, both the 5 gigahertz band and uh, uh, the 2.4 uh, unlicensed band. Uh, so in, in a way it's nothing new, but there is a lot of discussion going on with LTE unlicensed. So maybe you can, we can start talking about what is your view on um, this new tenant in the band? Well, we shouldn't be surprised that there's interest in doing more with 5 gigahertz. Uh, because Wi-Fi has been so successful there. Uh, we, if, uh, in case uh, your audience doesn't know, last year we shipped over a billion devices uh, that operate in five gigahertz. So we've been absolutely very successful with that. It's the, you know, the Wi-Fi certified AC is the first version of Wi-Fi that delivers gigabit per second. So uh, we have been, you know, tremendously successful operating in unlicensed. I would say we're uh, the model of success uh, in unlicensed. And so we shouldn't be surprised that there is interest in that. Um, you know, quickly the, the conversation is shifting toward how do we ensure uh, that whatever continues to happen in five gigahertz uh, uh, does not unduly impair uh, the current tenants in that band. Yeah, and, and this is, this is the, the major issue because it's, it's unlicensed so everybody can use it, but it's also meant for everybody to enjoy it. So the question is how, how can, all the different, uh, so say tenants, all the different uh, technologies that use the band coexist nicely. What's, what's, the, what's the approach? Well, at a very high level, it, it will require um, extreme collaboration, I would say. Uh, you know, the, the good news is Wi-Fi Line stands ready to collaborate on this front. We have a history of being able to collaborate successfully, uh, particularly with operators. You're probably familiar. We have uh, one of the very early programs that uh, probably ushered in the era of um, equipment that has both Wi-Fi and cellular came about through collaboration from Wi-Fi Alliance and CTIA uh, to make sure that devices that have Wi-Fi and cellular operate uh, both radios uh, concurrently without one unduly uh, impacting the other. And that has been terrifically successful. We can do that again in this, uh, in this area, that's our hope. Yeah, and this is, this is really an important precedent because Typically, you have, you know, each technology develops its own uh, uh, standards, rules, but here, what we have increasingly with mobile devices, it's uh, one device uh, that works with different technologies, networks where there are different access technologies that work together. So this would suggest uh, that th there is really, uh, the, the collaboration is, is very important because it's, you can really mandate something at the global basis, where which what the product, product needs, needs to be. And so how do you see the, the willingness of the participant to, to, to collaborate? How difficult is it? Especially given your, you know, your, your multi-year experience in dealing with, with cellular uh, from your end. That's right. Well, you know, collaboration is hard work. Uh, there's absolutely no doubt. We know a lot about that. You know, Wi-Fi has been very successful, even within Wi-Fi. Uh, and the solutions that uh, we have brought about have required a lot of collaboration. I would say that the complexity in something like LTU, LAA um, is, uh, you know, one order of magnitude uh, bigger than what we have had up to now to deal with uh, because it requires uh, collaboration and etiquette across different spectral domains, across different um, technologies, right, across licensed and non-licensed and across equipment that supports primarily one technology or another. And so it, uh, it definitely will require a lot of collaboration and, and um, um, that's, uh, you know, something that we are eager to get involved with. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, uh, you know, when you think about it, uh, the, the, the issue of nice behavior to each other, 
it's certainly sort of within Wi-Fi in the first place because with Wi-Fi you do have multiple networks using the same band, and the networks have to be nice to each other. So within the technology, you were you you had to to deal with the problem in the first place. And so right. how is Wi-Fi nice to itself first and foremost? Well, I would say uh, you know probably the the testament to the success in the Wi-Fi uh, etiquette protocols and good neighbor protocols that we have in in uh, old versions of Wi-Fi is. Uh, is that the density of the networks has continued to increase, the speed of the data transfer has continued to increase, and Wi-Fi continues to work well with other Wi-Fi, right? There's a number of uh, parameters that need to be considered in assessing how well a technology shares the medium, uh, but probably the ultimate testament is exactly what I said, right? That the technology continues to advance, uh, popularize, and increase in density. Um, and uh, you know, Wi-Fi has been able to do that. So we have uh, mechanisms in the protocol that address this. Uh, as I mentioned before, now the complexity is going to be uh, to make sure that the medium is shared so that all tenants uh, in unlicensed um, are able to operate in a way that doesn't, that doesn't unduly uh, impair the operation of other tenants. Mm -hmm. So what is the status with the LTE unlicensed right now? There's a lot of work in terms of standardization, a lot of talks and uh, how did you, would you qualify the, the situation right now? The, the way that we see it is that we're, you know, we're far from a solution uh, that uh, is broadly um, accepted as addressing the issues of uh, coexistence and fair sharing. And I say that because um, it's very early. The standardization work has just started. Uh, there's only a handful of uh, solutions that have been demonstrated with, uh, you know, no commercial solutions that we can go pull off the shelf today. And so uh, to have a solution that's harmonized, that's broadly understood, and that's um, sort of recognized for having all of these proper etiquette uh, techniques uh, within it requires peer evaluations. It requires implementation across different bands. Uh, it, is, it requires the collaboration across industry segments that we that, that we started off with, and um, you know a lot of that is very nascent. It, it, we're just starting with uh, you know with, with all of this. So uh, the, the good news is that it could be a seminal moment for uh, unlicensed in general, and that it might require a very close um, working collaboration across the different segments to make sure we continue to evolve in this terrific path of innovation that we've been on. Yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, and also uh, the, there is so there is a standardization work that it's very important. It's crucial to make sure we have a, a solution worldwide. But then there is also regulation, and mm -hmm. uh, so the, the unlicensed bands are regulated in a very different way in different countries. Uh, do you expect that? Uh, well, or, or do you think we need a stronger regulation to enforce nice behaviors of different technologies, or uh, is it necessary or not? What do you think? Uh, right. So, you know, our philosophy, which has served us well up to now, is that uh, less regulation is better. Um, that, of course, uh, is only a philosophy that can be upheld if there is proper self-policing, if, uh, you know, we're all operating from the principle of uh, instituting and uh, sharing the, the spectrum in the best possible way um, that uh, is very respectful toward other tenants in unlicensed, and um, and so when you have lighter regulation, you leave the door open uh, for even more innovation. And so our hope is that we can continue uh, to operate with that with those kind of basic principles um, set in place. You know, they're principles that have allowed unlicensed to again be uh, the model of innovation the last 15 years or so. And so, um, you know, our hope is that uh, in work, working in conjunction with the stakeholders that are interested in LAA, that we can continue on that path um, and, uh, and that we won't need necessarily any more heavy handed regulation uh, and certainly no more regulations that we currently have. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, you know, there is also the possibility uh, that uh, we won't be able to continue to operate in that mode, uh, right? Because uh, you know, the, so long as devices and solutions are operating within current regulations, um, you know, then they're operating legally. And, uh, but that may, uh, you know, there are ways to make that happen in a way that impairs the current users. I'll give you a very quick example. 
within Wi-Fi Alliance, we have policies just for Wi-Fi operation with other Wi-Fi gear to ensure that uh, devices don't operate in a way that impairs other Wi-Fi gear, just to ensure that we continue to share the medium in a way that's, that's fair. And uh, when that doesn't happen, we recognize that that hurts everybody. And so we um, operate in a, in, a, in a way, in a very open and transparent way that's self-policing. Uh, so we have policies like that in place. Now we need to take that to the next level and ensure that things like that are, are taken into account uh, in this new era of potentially many different technologies operating in a license. Yeah, and uh, I mean, you have a good model in terms of making sure, you know, what, when you do your, in your certification program, you, you test the, the, the coexistence of uh, Wi-Fi um, gear. Um, now, it, when it comes to LTE and license, however, that, there is no obvious way to do that yet. Um, and I wonder whether that, that, is, that is going to become a requirement or how is it done? Because the standards are excellent in providing a framework, but within a standard, multiple things are allowed, different uh, vendors interpret the standards differently. So at some point, somebody needs to make sure that that's really correct. And it could be the operators, it could be vendors, it could be a third, uh, uh, you know, uh, an, an association similar to the Wi-Fi Alliance. How do you see that happening? Or what do you think we need to, to make sure that, that is the case? Well, ideally, uh, there, there could be, you know, some third party validation that's ensuring that um, you know, gear is properly uh, configured or developed uh, within not only within the standards and within the regulations, but beyond that, right? We need a higher bar in non-license. And the higher bar is to ensure, uh, you know, proper coexistence, uh, so that the medium is is not impaired, and so that end users are, are not unduly harmed. And um, so, my, you know, my hope is that the, that that will eventually uh, uh, be put in place. You know, the good news is you know, we're ready to, you know, participate in that if, uh, if there's interest in Wi-Fi Alliance participating. If, uh, if it's needed, you know, we'll take on the work. Uh, and uh, beyond that, you know, there's enough of our members interested in this. And we already have a task group that's focused on, on, co on looking at uh, coexistence. So um, we will have to monitor this space. Yeah, yeah. Now, um, you, you brought up the, the issue of the, of the user. And uh, oftentimes in, in our discussions about uh, uh, LAA, we, we always focus on the mobile operators. And, uh, but, but actually, there is the enterprise that is a major user, user of uh, Wi-Fi, and then residential that's uh, consumer users. Uh, how, what is the best way to protect their, um, I mean, the, their access to the band. How do we maximize it for everybody involved? Not just the Wi-Fi users, not just the LTE users, but everybody out there. I, I tell you, we have a lot of experience with this. And, um, you know, you're absolutely right that it comes, um, you, you have to start with a focus on the end user. And you, you have to start with a focus on getting it right instead of getting it right now. And uh, this is terrifically important in order to come out with, the best possible solution that continues not only to you know honor that legacy of making sure that we're getting the most value out of one license, but but also continues uh, to keep us on this path, uh, so that in the future we'll continue to count on you know the best etiquette toward on license use, and uh, it requires an awful lot of collaboration um, and uh, discussion across you know the, the different stakeholders. Uh, again, I, I, the key thing here is that now the stakeholders that are interested in 5 gigahertz is expanding uh, beyond, you know, not just Wi-Fi and other tenants of the 5 gigahertz spectrum that we've had up to now, but it will include this new use case, uh, you know, with, with an operator focus. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Now, in terms of uh, splitting up the, the spectrum resources, and I guess we don't, we don't think, we shouldn't be thinking about splitting them up, but effectively, when you have a listen before talk type of uh, mechanism, there are different technologies that agree on how to split the channel and how to, you know. And uh, uh, right now, uh, oftentimes the 5 gigahertz band is not used so heavily that it's not a problem. Different technologies can take a different channel, that's fine. That's a very simple solution. But when you have to share a channel, how do you go about it? Because you can share, you can allocate more or less capacity to different technologies depending on the usage or depending. How do, 
What's a, what do you think it's a fair framework to do that? Well, uh, a framework uh, is fair when um, it's not self-centered, right? When it, when it takes into account all of the different energy that is being emitted by, you know, all of the folks using that spectrum at that time. And so uh, there's a lot of discussion that needs to happen about um, how we take into account the different sharing mechanisms that are going to be employed by different industries. Uh, you know, it's not necessarily the case that one size is going to fit all here, but what we need is solutions that take into account uh, everyone else, right? And and in the case of Wi-Fi, it's been listened before talk. Uh, you know, it's been, you know, algorithmic back-off mechanisms and, and other mechanisms that we use that have proven effective. Uh, you know, that that may need to evolve, but certainly Wi-Fi will need to be uh, taken into account when new solutions come into the 5 gigahertz and other unlicensed spectral domains because Wi-Fi has been very successful. And, um, you know, it's you, you can count on the solutions that are there today with Wi-Fi using 5 gigahertz to be there for a very long time. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it, it, it's something that you don't do in a vacuum, I suppose, is the short answer. Yeah. Now, at the same time, you know, we've been talking about LTE and license, but Wi-Fi is also moving in many ways along the same direction in terms of making it easier for Wi-Fi to be integrated with the uh, mobile in uh, cellular networks. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what's, what are the next moves at the Wi-Fi alliance? What should we expect in terms of your, you know, commitment to get Wi-Fi to work with, with cellular? Right. So this is very much aligned with, um, you, you know, our commitment to continue to make Wi-Fi better for all stakeholders. But, you know, certainly uh, operators have been making their interest known within Wi-Fi Alliance. And we're working currently on things like multiband operations to ensure that, you know, there's a seamless way uh, to go from, you know, for, from, let's say, um, one uh, spectrum to the other, right, 2.4, 5 gigahertz, et cetera. Uh, and to make that in a way that's seamless to the end user and very easy to manage for the operator. Uh, we're working on areas to continue to improve power efficiency, uh, manage at the network layer. We're improving uh, pass point. As you know, we're in the uh, third generation uh, being developed right now. So we have a number, you know, a multitude of uh, solutions that we're working on that should be of keen interest to operators. Uh, and, uh, the reality is Wi-Fi has become in, integral to uh, operators in their own services. Uh, so, you know, it, it shouldn't be surprising that we're working hard to continue to make it better for operators uh, as we are, you know, continuing to make it better for a number of the other vertical segments that we serve. Yeah, yeah. And I guess, of course, voice over Wi-Fi is the one that uh, comes up the most when, uh, you know, when we talk about LPL and license as well, that's the uh, voice over Wi-Fi comes up all the time. So that's, that's also another direction in which Wi-Fi becomes closer to the uh, to you know LTE basically. Well, you know, yeah, it's it's sort of uh, the topic du jour, right? But the reality is, Wi-Fi worked on enabling voice over Wi-Fi, uh, you know, uh, many years ago, um, and uh, you know now I, again I see it as a testament to the efficacy of Wi-Fi, the reliability of Wi-Fi, the confidence that operators have in rolling out some of their core services over Wi-Fi. And um, and it's here, so it's a it's a terrific testament. Now, uh, you know, my hope uh, and all indicators are, are that we're evolving toward a world where, as a part of the operator headnet, Wi-Fi will just fade into the background, and users will just be connected the best possible way, whether it's on you know cellular or on licensed networks, and. Um, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm encouraged by this progression toward bringing that about because that's really users want the best experience uh, full stop, right? So we're working to try to make that uh, come about. Yeah, yeah. We don't make wireless really invisible. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so just in, in closing, uh, can you tell me what, what, do you, what do you expect over the next uh, uh, year or so in terms of the coexistence of Wi-Fi and LTE and license? You know, the biggest thing is that we need to work very closely together uh, to understand um, our interests in, in making sure that uh, we come up with the best solutions uh, in 5 gigahertz that don't impair either the, the experience that folks might have with any 5 gigahertz solution uh, today, but also that sets us on a path toward, um, you know, a, a positive future for our license well into the future. 
th this is a pivotal moment in that it's requiring different in industries that have operated very independently um, to, uh, to, to get intensely close to each other and to work uh, very well together uh, because our interests are, are, are joined. And, uh, you know, to the extent that, uh, that we can evolve towards successful solutions uh, in sharing five gigahertz, uh, we will have a bright future together. Yeah. Well, uh, Edgar, thank you so much for uh, sharing your thoughts with us today. And uh, um, so this, uh, this conversation was uh, a part of our report on uh, uh, LTN license and its coexistence with Wi-Fi that uh, Sensafilia has developed in collaboration with RCR Wireless News. And the report is, able, uh, is available for download from uh, the Sensafilia website and the uh, RCR Wireless News website. Thank you very much for listening.